how do we know where the enemy is going to go? Okay, we'll make it really simple. Or how to force this where the enemy is. So we know we got five zones, right? Zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five. To make it simple, we're going to simplify it to four zones, right? Upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. Okay. We know that our sword is going to be covering one zone, so one zone isn't an option. And our back foot is really far back, so really that's another zone that's not an option. Then our dagger also covers another zone. So there's really only one open zone. Okay? So if I want to force you to go to a certain place, I can close off two of these zones. So you're only going to go to the one open zone. Right? Okay? Or another way to make it really good is say you happen to be a low guard. Okay? And I want this zone to be attacked. So I'm going to have this zone closed off, my left zone closed off, and, and this third zone over here is also closed off because uh, my foot's so far back. So if I go here, okay, you're not going to attack here. This zone's closed off. You're not attacking though, you're not attacking there. You're only going to attack here. That's the open zone, right? So what your question was, was when I do this and you go to that open zone, what do you do once it gets closed? Do you just go back to the zone? Okay. So the answer to this is whenever you're fencing someone, you know that you have to attack into the open zone. Because if you attack into a closed zone, it's going to simply give them the weapon and they're going to reap them. Right. So what you do is if you're, say, you're in this stance, okay, what you do is you attack the open zone. And as you're attacking, you register whether they're going to get the parry or not. If I start my attack and you start your parry, then I can look and see and I go, okay, he's going to get the parry in time, so I'm not going to land this attack. So what I do is mid-attack, before my attack ends, I register that it's going to fail. Since I know my attack's going to fail, I instead turn it into a faint. So now as I've gone here, I know you're going to get the parry, so I faint back to the other side of him, to the next side. So I attack, I see it's going to fail, so I turn my failed attack into a feint, and I attack the new open zone. Okay. Okay, so now this is like level one fencing. This is like how you beat an intermediate fencer. You just feint, or you throw a true attack, you realize it's going to fail, because a good feint is an attack that you recognize is going to fail, because you're attacking a real area that they have no choice but to pay. Okay, so you attack there, and you realize it's going to fail, you go back over here. Okay, well now at the higher level, or if you're attacking in someone's best parry, which is usually their panic parry, we're like, shit, they will get that parry. They'll get their quick. At the high level, they will parry your feint. Okay? So, what happens is, if I throw this attack, and you start to parry, and I go to uh, essentially change the line and feint over here, and I see that you're going to get that parry, I just go back to the original one. Okay. So it becomes a double thing. Now, other people that are really good, what they'll do is you'll attack, say, um, let's see, that, what's an easy way to do this? We'll do, we'll do, I attack here, you go to cross parry. I register that you're going to get that, so I go over here. You, you go to stop this thing with that hand because you can change momentum once, right? Mm -hmm. But now I know that, and I'm going to go over here, but you're smart, so you raise your sword up to parry. So now I would go low, because that one is too far away to stop from here. This one is now moving away from the target, and they're both locked in momentum. So that's at the really high level. Okay. So at the really high level, when I attack someone, I will attack their opening, and this is just to begin it. So whenever I'm fencing, I know that my first attack's not going to land. If it does land, cool. But I never ever plan on my first attack landing. I just attack their open zone to provoke them, and then go to the new open zone, and then I wait to see which parry they're going to do. And even that, you don't technically have to wait to see which parry they're going to do. Here, let's come this way a little bit. Based on how my opponent is standing and how he's holding his sword, already tells me which parry he's going to do. So, say for example, if someone is rear weight, they're holding their sword here and their dagger here, then they're probably be doing giganti or doing Kappa Fair, which means they might be doing this parry. Especially if they're doing Giganti, they're probably going to do this parry. Okay? If they're stanced up in a low guard, and like a tiger stance, here, they're going to be cross parry. Mm -hmm. So I already know, based on how they're standing, which direction they're going to go when I throw my attack to retreat. And based on how they're holding their sword and where they're holding their sword, it tells me which parry they're going to do. 
So I already know when I attack the opening, which weapon they're going to parry with first. And then when I disengage, based on the match that they do, I know whether they're going to try to parry that with the same weapon or they're going to use a different weapon. And then I know which parry they're going to do there as well. So essentially, you throw your first attack to pull out one of their parries. Then you throw your second attack to pull out, say, their other parry. Say, for this example, you just like parry over with your sword because you realize it's a tempo. Then I already knew that you were going to start with that one and go with that one. So now I would go here. Okay. Okay? So that's a good way to think about fencing is, is you can break it down to be really simple. One, if you got hit, it's because you were too close. That's the most simple thing in fencing. You get hit because you're too close. So your mindset can go, how do I make my enemy be too close? And then two, you go, where is my enemy going to go? Well, you know based on how they're standing, which direction they're going to go, most logically, and how and where they're holding their sword tells you um, how they're going to parry. So then you know when you attack the opening, you know how they're going to parry, and then you know that you have to go to the next opening, you know how they're going to parry that one as well. Then you spent both those tempos, and they probably retreated by them, which spent their other tempo. So then you just attack where now they cannot reach. So when you're readjusting your bank into a different attack, is that just because it was either so fast or so slow, either one, it, are you just redirecting your tip? Because I never saw you so, interrupt the tempo of your hand that was coming. So forward. what I personally do, this is why I don't always do sword before body, because sword before body makes this real hard. So if I go here and say you're in low guard, and I extend my arm fully, now to disengage, I already spent my arm. Right. Okay, so I have to try and use my wrist or use my feet. Mm -hmm. If on my initial attack, I use my feet and I just present my arm a little bit like this, I still have the tempo of my arm to move and I still have the tempo of my wrist to read. Okay. So now, if I use the tempo of my feet for my initial attack, but of course I'm still covering the line, right? That's the key. Okay, I'm still covering the line. Boom, I go here, you move your arm, okay? Now I move my arm, which causes you to move your sword over. Now I still have the tempo of my wrist left, and I also fully didn't spin the arm. Okay, that's why it was working, because it standing on this side, you just seem to be one smooth, continuous attack. Correct, and you do want it in one smooth motion. So like the smooth motion would be like this. I go here and present, you move your arm. I go to extend my arm a little bit, then it's just wrist and I finish with my feet as well. Okay. It's why it's so important for us to be able to separate the segment of the arm, the legs, and the body and everything. Especially because like, I could get those same type of circumstances by saving the tempo of my body like I was talking about earlier. So for example, say, um, we'll just make this one easy and say I throw a cut from my elbow descending this way and you're going to parry up with your sword. Okay, I'm going to attack your okay. right and you're going to parry up with your sword. Okay. So say, boom, say I happen to be like doing long sword or something and like I'm in high guard and I descend at the elbow and you go to parry, right? Well now what I can do is I can use the tempo of my body to get lower, right? And then if I've gone here and you go to parry out and then now you go to parry down because the tempo of my body and I still have the tempo of my wrist left, I can still get over on the tempo of the wrist. Okay. So there's like a ton of different crazy ways you can mix it up, whether you spend the tempo of your body first, the tempo of your hand first, the tempo of your feet first. You just usually, like most people, spend all of them at once and it's, think they're going to hit someone on their first shot, which is crazy. So like a lot of people will go like this. They're like, I'm going to do sword before body, especially people that are like, I'm going to do sword, body, lead, and foot all at once. So they go here. They've just spent everything, so if their attack fails, they've got nothing left to be able to mutate or do anything. And most people aren't even separating the tempo of the wrist from the tempo of the arm. Okay? And to get really complex, you technically have a segment, so we have tempos and we have segments, right? Mm -hmm. A tempo is one time of a movement. Okay? A segment are separate limbs, or what I call separate propulsion points. So I can extend my arm and use one tempo. I can extend my arm and my leg, and I use two segments of one tempo, right? Now, so a segment, a way to break it down easily is, is the legs are one segment, the body's one segment, each arm is a segment. But to break it down even more complex, every joint, every pivot point is a segment. 
So what I mean by this is if I use my shoulder to cut, I still have the, te the segment of my elbow to change it and the segment of my wrist, okay? Then I have the segment of my ankle and I have the segment of my knee and I can still fully extend. On okay. top of that, you have the segment of the head, the segment of the hips. So every single part of your body that can bend is also a separate place you can change to increase your force levels. Most people, when they lunge, they think about the leg as a whole when they push, but realistically, you can get explosion from your toes first, because I can just hit you just by moving my toes mm -hmm. alone, or by using my toes and my ankle, or by extending toes, ankle, knee, and hip turn, and then your other leg. So all of these separate joints are different places that you can use to move in, in time or out of time and to train to get faster and stronger. It's why like a lot of times when I fence people, they'll think they have me and they think I'm tempo. But I'm very consciously aware of all my different segments. So say for example, um, I extended my arm and my leg and you parry and I cross here and you uh, fake it and you go over here and you think that I spent all my tempo, but I still have the tempo of my hip left. So I'll just mutate into a cut. I already spent all this, but I can just mutate uh, here. Uh, and so people, a lot of times, they'll be like, you were there and I thought I had the hip, but how did I get hit? And it's because we're being consciously aware of every single segment on our body that we can move, which is why the classes we do, we will slowly be teaching you every single segment. And we start at the feet, because this is the segment that keeps you safe, right? The segment of the hand right now is what we're going over to gain you control. Okay. And then we'll cover segment of the body later. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. It absolutely does. I don't think I'm doing my hand correctly. Like my wrist is too stiff when I lunge, if that makes sense. Let me sense. see how you're holding your sword. Um, so hold your sword. So I think part of it is how you're holding your sword. So one of the good ways to hold the sword, a lot of people will like grip it like this. Mm -hmm. What I do is I bring this grip part oh, on the right. bottom it's of my hand. So I don't even have to close my hand. It leverages to be in my hand and then I can just be really loose with it. So oh, this part's like okay. chilling on my palm and then it's loose and I don't like, I can have my hand open and not even have my thumb on it and it will stay. Uh, okay, that might be what it is. So then if it's this way, well, that's, I'll just have to get used to the grip that way. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's, that might help. I think that might be what it is. And so we're kind of here and then I just close it and then I kind of rest my thumb on top. Cause then if I want, I can use my thumb mm -hmm. as well or squeeze my hand. What this also does is having my hand loose is when I squeeze it, it causes an action which like how we are covering before, like the fingers is its own tempo as well. Because oh, right. see how like I could thrust my arm to you, okay, then I could use my wrist and then I could squeeze my hand. Oh, damn, okay. Yep, and that one works really good on like a cut. So I'm going here and then I use my wrist and say you go to parry, then I squeeze my hand and I get there even quicker. Okay. So. That position drill right. that we do, one reason it's so good is it actually is teaching you the different segments too. So it's like we go here, we use tempo of the shoulder, then we use tempo of the wrist, and then we use tempo of the elbow, right? And then here it's tempo of the elbow, tempo of the wrist, tempo of the shoulder. Oh, damn, okay. So that drill that I have us do does a lot, right? And then it's shoulder, wrist, elbow, hip turn, tempo of the feet, and then tempo of the wrist again. Then now it's tempo of the elbow. Oh, tempo damn. Of the wrist, okay. Tempo of the shoulder, tempo of the body, tempo of the feet. Ah, okay, okay. Now that's making sense. Yeah, so. Okay, so that's very cool. That, that's why I said like that drill, like there's a lot we do that'll brainwash you, where like you won't realize the amount of stuff that you're separating, but I made these drills where you don't have to think about it, and then later on when we point it out, you'll be like, oh wow, that drill really does Right, and that's why, that's why the only thing I'm doing. That's why the only thing I'm doing is just those first couple of initial drills until I get that just Perfect. brought in. But that brings up a, a, a question I have on my lunges. 
So the way after we did the munging at, at your house, um, I've just been working on when I went to get my lunge, I've just been lining my knee and my sword where I want it to go. Perfect. Good. To hit the different test balls. I've got one like above, medium, and below, and I just kind of go down the line. But my question is, how could, because that really helped my accuracy, yeah. because it looks I like get it everything lined up, good. and then I just, it just works. Yeah. But how do I aim my lunges from not being in this position? Like, I'm in a regular. Yeah. So, so you can line up with your front leg or your front toe if you want to, right? Okay. So we're on the left side, so we're lining with our left leg and our left toe. Right, and this, this was really helpful because all I need to do, just extend, everything's in line, get to where I want it to go. Exactly. So now we just run with that same concept, right? So now, okay, if um, I'm facing you and my sword is here, I'm lining up my front foot and my front leg, and I'm extending, and then I'm extending my front hand. Okay. So whichever side I am, my sword's going to be in line with that and my feet. And then I just extend to push my leg forward and extend my hand. Okay, what I think I've been doing is when I... I don't think I'm doing my hand correctly. Like my wrist is too stiff when I lunge. That makes Let sense. me see how you're holding your sword. Um, so hold your sword. So I think part of it is how you're holding your sword. So one of the good ways to hold the sword, a lot of people will like grip it like this. Mm -hmm. What I do is I bring this grip part oh, on the right. bottom it's of my hand. So I don't even have to close my hand. It leverages to be in my hand and then I can just be really loose with it. Oh, so this part's like okay. chilling on my palm and then it's loose and I don't like, I can have my hand open and not even have my thumb on it and it will stay. Uh, okay, that might be what it is. So then if it's this way, well, that's, I'll just have to get used to the grip that way. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's, that might help. I think that might be what it is. And so we're kind of here, and then I just close it, and then I kind of rest my thumb on top. 